Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me say welcome, as well as Paul. As he said, my name is Matty. I'm one of the trainee ministers here at church. It's lovely to welcome you as we celebrate Easter Sunday together. Uh, for the next while, we'll need to be back in John chapter 20, so back on page 906 in the church Bibles, if you're using one of them. And I'm going to pick up the reading that Lucy left off earlier. I'm going to read from verse 11 down to verse 23. Then I'm also going to read verses 30 and 31 of John 20 as well. So if we find that, we'll be in the right place. As we're flicking it up though, as Steve mentioned earlier, all those lights going boom, boom, boom and on in his head. We know that that only ever happens if the Lord helps us to understand his word. So I'm going to lead us in prayer before I come to read God's word. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that we've just been singing that in Christ our hope springs eternal. And so we pray now as we come to read your word that you would show us by your Holy Spirit the certainty of our hope if our trust is in the risen Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So John chapter 20 and reading from verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and as she wept she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Then just jumping down to verse 30, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. It was a really wise man who once said, Christmas is important, but Easter is absolutely crucial. Very wise man indeed. I don't know if you can guess who that was. It actually wasn't a bishop or a celebrity preacher. It was Arsene Wenger, the formal Arsenal manager, and I think he had in mind the different fixtures of the football season. But in saying it, in in describing that crucial point of the season for Arsenal, Wenger unwittingly hit at the central truth at the heart of the Christian faith. You see, right at the heart of Christianity, we find Jesus, not cute little baby Jesus lying in the manger, But no, Jesus, the King, the risen, death-conquering King. That's why we think Easter is absolutely crucial, because it lies not just at the heart of our faith, but if it's true, it is the most significant thing which has ever happened throughout all of human history. And that's why, as we saw in our reading, as Louise prayed for us earlier, John wants us to see and to believe throughout this passage. He wants us to see the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. He wants us to believe with confidence that the Jesus who really, really did die on Good Friday on a Roman cross and was really laid in a tomb also is the same Jesus who really rose again that first Easter day. But we're also 
even as we're invited to see and believe, we're invited to do so with more than just mere intellectual certainty. That's why I read those second couple of verses from the end of that chapter. John wants his reader to do more than just see and to believe, to just know that these things happened. He wants his reader to come to know Jesus, to believe in him fully, and in so doing, to have life in Jesus' name. What's on offer in the Easter story? What makes Easter so crucial is that it's not about just fun facts about a man who was dead and then wasn't. No, it's about life. Easter is about abundant, joyful, endlessly satisfying, never-ending life. So Jesus' resurrection from the dead has implications that last much, much longer than when the last Easter egg wrapper is stored away in the bin. Now, my friends, Jesus' resurrection changes everything. And it's as we grasp that, we find that it also changes and shapes our whole lives forever. And so to help us reflect on that in our time together, you'll see on the reverse side of the notice sheet, there's a couple of points I want us to consider in this passage. Two brief things I want us to to think about. Jesus really rose from the dead. And because Jesus really rose, it's really really good news. So first of all then, Jesus really rose, and we read again from verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. I'm sure that we can imagine something of what Mary is going through here in these first couple of verses. See, Jesus really, really did die on Good Friday at the end of chapter 19. We saw that, and because he died on the Jewish Sabbath, Mary has been forced to wait three days to go and attend to the body of her lost friend, her lost teacher and Lord. And so I think we see something very relatable, something very human in her reaction, because she, having been forced to wait so long, is just desperate to get to the tomb, desperate to complete the burial rituals, desperate to go and pay her lost friend this final act of dignity and love. Wouldn't you be? Isn't that exactly what we would do if we find out that a lost loved one has died? Wouldn't we just be desperate to get to their side? And if we had to delay, all the more desperate to go and do whatever we could to mark our grief. And Mary is so desperate that she sets out very early while it's still dark. Again, a very human and understandable reaction. Get me to the tomb as soon as possible. One thing, though, John is really big throughout his gospel. He's big into light and darkness imagery. And so the fact that he records this detail, that it's still dark, that gives us a clue about what's going on behind this. Even behind Mary's very understandable, very human reaction, he tells us that it's dark because Mary herself is still in the dark about what's going on with Jesus' death. She doesn't yet have room in her worldview to consider that Jesus may have risen from the dead, even though throughout his life he consistently said that that's what would happen. But even though she can't yet bring herself to think that, she does set in motion the wheels for two big evidences that Jesus really has risen from the dead. And one of them involves her, we'll see that again later, but the first involves Peter and John, We see throughout verses 2 to 10 that John sees the grave clothes and he believes. Now, if you were to scan your eyes back over verses 3 to 7, we read of how Peter and John, that's the, the phrase he uses to describe himself, the disciple that Jesus loved. That means John, the guy writing this account. 
So Peter and John, they go to the tomb, and we see, among other things, in verses 3 to 7, that verse 4, they were running together, but the other disciple, John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And then verse 6, Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb first. Now, I don't know about you, I can just imagine Peter and John getting back to the other disciples after all this and telling others, it's amazing, Jesus, he was dead, now he's alive again, isn't it wonderful? And the other disciples say, yeah, yeah, great, but but who got to the tomb first? And Peter says, you know what, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. And John goes, oh yeah, sure, doesn't matter, but I'll just make a note that it was me. Why does he record such minute detail here? Well, I think at least part of the reason is that it smacks of eyewitness testimony. This is how we tell stories, certainly how I tell stories, not in a linear, matter-of-fact, bullet-point fashion, but, well, I got there first. Oh, no, but Peter was running, but I overtook him, and I got there first. But he went into the tomb first, but I got there first. That's how we tell stories. Even these wee details, then, about who arrived and who did what when should be building our confidence that we're reading eyewitness testimony, the account of people who really did find Jesus' tomb empty that morning. But also importantly, not totally empty, the grave linens that Jesus' body had been wrapped in on Friday evening after his crucifixion, they're still there. Again, why go into that level of detail? Who cares? Well, there's a couple of interesting things in it. First of all, it does away with one popular attempt to explain away and rationalize the resurrection. It's called swoon theory, and it says that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just sort of passed out from the pain, and then with a bit of time to recover in a nice, cool tomb, he was able to rouse himself and get out on Easter Sunday. Now, there are some major flaws in that theory, not least how to explain that a man who, was, who had experienced professional executioners, knowing with certainty that he was dead, how someone in that kind of state could recover so well and so quickly with no medical intervention to be able to roll away a very large stone from his tomb. That's one flaw with that theory. But also the detail recorded here says that the first eyewitnesses That's not what they saw. The fact that that Jesus' grave clothes had been left behind is actually quite significant. Because presumably a nearly dead but slightly recovered Jesus would have at best stumbled out of the tomb, clinging to survival and not worrying about what he was wearing. But that's not the Jesus that John presents us with in this chapter. Second really interesting detail about the grave clothes is that earlier in John's gospel, we read the story of Lazarus, one of Jesus' friends who dies, but Jesus raises him back to life again. It's a wonderfully moving story as Jesus weeps over his friend, but then calls him out of his tomb. When Lazarus comes out of his tomb, he's still wearing his grave linens. If Lazarus' resurrection is a temporary release from death. Well, Jesus' resurrection here is different. For Jesus, death hasn't just been evaded, hasn't just been beaten for now. No, for Jesus, death has been completely defeated once and for all. That's why he gets to take off his funeral clothes and leave them behind. He won't need them again. And maybe that's why the folded grave clothes are significant enough, that small detail that we might not even take much notice of. For John, just seeing the grave clothes is enough to have a profound effect on him. As we read on verse 8, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Seeing Jesus' grave clothes lying folded neatly in his now empty tomb, that's enough for John to see and to believe. Now, maybe it's a nervous, cautious belief at first. After all, he records that they didn't fully understand what was going on yet. 
so maybe he couldn't explain it fully. But already, John knows that there's only one explanation for what he's just seen, namely, that the Jesus he knows, the Jesus he has shared his life with for three years, the Jesus whom he holds in such high esteem that the only way he wants to be remembered himself is as the one who was loved by Jesus, the Jesus who he saw suffer and die three days before, this is the same Jesus who has risen now from the dead. For John, that's the only explanation that fits. And what's a a dawning realization of hope for John is even more vividly realized by Mary herself as we pick up her story in verse 11. You see, John sees the grave clothes and believe. Wonderfully, Mary sees Jesus himself and believes. So by verse 11, we see that the sun is up, but Mary is still in the dark. Here she is, having made her way back to the tomb, and she's standing outside it, weeping, as she looks in and finds it empty. And we can see where Mary's head is at by a bit of repetition. Verse 13, she says, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Verse 15, she says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. It's quite striking that on the one hand, Mary is so strong in her devotion to Jesus. And yet on the other, she can't move beyond this idea that someone must have taken his body away. He must have died. And so his body must have been moved. And she desperately, desperately wants to know where the body is. Again, completely understandably. But her two statements of they've taken him away they're met with two questions. Another thing we see throughout John's gospel of account of Jesus' life is that questions are really important. They, they get the reader to sit up and think about what's going on. It's the same story with the questions that Mary gets asked. First of all, why are you weeping? The angels ask it. Jesus himself asks the same thing. Why are you weeping? Now, if you've ever lost someone dear to you, you'll know that weeping is an entirely understandable and natural response. We can't help ourselves but weep. We should weep when we lose someone dear. And so when the question is asked of Mary here, it's not in a genuinely curious way as if people, these people can't understand human emotion. But nor is it asked in a really cruel or mocking way, saying, I can't believe you don't understand this. Why on earth are you weeping? No, it's being asked, maybe with the slightest hint of correction, Mary, why are you crying? You know me. You know that I've told you all along that I would rise from the dead, and here I am. So in that sense, the first question serves as the first sign for Mary that her natural response to grief is no longer the right one. Jesus is risen. There's no need to cry anymore. And in that sense then, this first glimpse for Mary of the hope of Jesus' resurrection is also the first glimpse for us at the reality that even death has now lost its sting because Jesus has risen from the dead. Here we see the the first glorious hint of why Easter Sunday is so crucial, such good news for all of us. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, like Steve was sharing with us earlier, that gives us real and certain hope for every single day. Even when we stand squarely in the middle of our worst, whatever our worst may be, this morning even, we never lose the certain hope that the resurrection gives us. If even death has been defeated, We always have cause for real and tangible and life-giving hope. 
We know that as a church, there are many people among our church family who are going through very profoundly difficult things even now. Friends, it's right that we should weep when we face the hard things of life, but we weep with hope. Even this morning, I invite you to feed on the truth that Jesus is risen from the dead and know the sure and certain hope that he brings. And I hope that it sustains you even through this current time of trial. And if you're here this morning, though, as someone who doesn't yet follow Jesus, wouldn't yet call yourself a Christian, you're very much just investigating things for the first time, let me invite you to consider whether that's a hope that you want to get in on. Again, Easter isn't just a nice, comforting story. It's a a true historical fact that gives us true life-giving hope. But this first question then leads naturally on to the second. We've asked, whom are you, why are you weeping? Now we see Jesus asking, whom are you seeking? What kind of savior are you expecting? One who's a really good teacher, a performer of impressive feats, but ultimately is stopped dead by a Roman cross? Or a Savior who is Lord and God, conqueror over even death itself, and therefore worthy of a lifetime of service and devotion and praise? If she's in any doubt about who she's seeking, Mary goes away knowing exactly who Jesus is. In a really moving scene, as soon as Jesus speaks her name, just one word, Mary, it dawns on her. And now she sees and believes that Jesus is risen. And she is sent away, lovingly instructed not to cling to him because she doesn't have to cling to him. I imagine if we had a a loved one who was gravely ill but recovered, we want to cling to them. We want to, to make the most of every single second to cling on. But Jesus is saying, no, no, it's okay, Mary. This resurrection is not a temporary thing. This is not a near miss that will give us another few happy years of friendship. No, Jesus' resurrection is a sign of who Jesus is. God in human form who knows perfect equality with God the Father, and who is therefore returning to him to rule and to reign forever. I've mentioned a couple of times that all this reads like eyewitness testimony. John really wants us to see that these things are not symbols. They're not just nice ideas to send us out with nice things to think about over our Easter lunch. We are invited instead to see and to believe here. We're being invited to consider that these verses are not the wishful thinking of grieving friends, but the eyewitness testimony of skeptics who had their whole worldview turned upside down. This is so important a point to make that later in the New Testament, another New Testament writer says that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then the Christian faith is entirely meaningless and Christians should be pitied. But here John is demonstrating Jesus to be a death-conquering king worthy of following with our whole lives. Fundamentally, the very question of whether Christianity is true or not rests on this question of the empty tomb. I I mentioned one competing theory of how people account for the empty tomb of Jesus earlier. Some others are that maybe Mary went to the wrong tomb, but then the authorities of the day could have easily pointed that out. Another theory is that This was all a mass hallucination, but loads and loads of diverse witnesses saw the risen Jesus. We read of more examples throughout John and the other Gospels and a later book called Acts. And then another popular theory that the disciples must have stolen Jesus' body to perpetuate the myth that he rose from the dead. But that would require us to believe that the sea men who we read of even here who are locked away in a room out of fear of being persecuted for having known Jesus somehow summoned up the courage to sneak past a guard of Roman soldiers, roll away a very heavy stone, take Jesus' body and keep it hidden for the rest of their lives and to a man all go to their own deaths saying that they saw the risen Jesus without ever one of them breaking ranks or slipping up on the lie. Friends, I don't think that's a plausible explanation. 
And I'm not alone. Uh, there's a famous quote by Charles Coulson, who was the lead counsel to the White House during Richard Nixon's presidency. He summed it up like this. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. The Watergate scandal embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me that 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. There's obviously much more that could be said about all those various theories. We really don't have time, nor is this the appropriate place to dig into them. But I do want us to really see that instead of any of those things, John himself as a writer is drawing his reader to see the fact of the empty tomb and to come to the same logical conclusion as him, to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And if we do find ourselves believing that, then it changes everything, which is our second and more brief point. If Jesus really rose, then it's really good news. We thought about one of the really wonderful implications of resurrection earlier, the, the certain hope that it gives us in the face of even death. I want us to reflect briefly on just two more that the text highlights. Uh, first of all, peace. That's what Jesus himself says twice to the disciples when he appears to them from verses 19 onwards. Peace be with you. Interestingly, he says that as he shows them his wounded side, his wounded hands. It's another sign that this isn't a hallucination. This isn't a, a, a projection of, of a grief-stricken mind. This is a real, physical, bodily, resurrected Jesus the same one they loved and knew, the same one they would have recognized, not just restored to health, but to glorious new life. That's how he's able to get into a locked room without any difficulty. There's something more going on here than just him being revived. But again, the point Jesus wants to draw home, peace. There are several different layers to peace, but most significantly of all, surely, is that it's the assurance he is giving them that they, and by extension us, can now know peace with God. I don't know if you naturally think of yourself as being at war, but the Bible tells us that that's the state that exists between ourselves and God. We are born hating and rejecting God, not living according to his rules, and at war with him. That's what the Bible calls sin, and it's a problem that we ourselves can't solve. But Jesus can. That's why Jesus died. And by rising, he is now saying, war is over, peace is here. The enmity and hostility that exists by nature between us and God is replaced by peace with him if we trust that in dying on the cross, Jesus took our sin and rejection of God on himself, paid the price for it, and then rose from the dead to be the king that we follow and trust in, to know that he truly does bring us peace with the God who made us. So if you're here this morning with us as someone who's not yet a Christian, and the thing that keeps holding you back is the thought of, well, maybe I'm too bad a person. Uh, maybe I've messed up too many times. God could never forgive me. In those moments, let me invite you to look to the risen Jesus and to hear him saying to you, peace be with you. If you trust in him, the war is over. The debt of your sin has been paid, and it is never too great to know the peace that Jesus brings. If our trust is in Jesus, we can know God as a friend, and his resurrection proves it. So that's peace, and then the final one is proclaiming. Jesus says to the disciples, peace be with you. And in verse 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And the verse that I left out because I missed my place, and crucially, verse 21, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Sending them out, proclaiming the good news of his resurrection. You see, peace with God is very, very good news indeed. And that's why the second implication here is that the disciples go into the world and proclaim and tell everyone that Jesus has risen and has brought about the forgiveness of our sin and rejection of God. And that's a work that we are still engaged in today as a church. If you are among us this morning as one of our guests, we're so, so glad you're here, not just because we like to meet nice, new, interesting people and have good conversations, though that's all great, but because we fully believe that the crucial message of Easter, the truth that Jesus really rose from the dead, and that by so doing, he brought peace with God if we believe in him, Well, as a church, we think that is good news that is worth shouting from the rooftops. And that's the natural point to end this morning then. Throughout John chapter 20, we are drawn to see and to believe, to know with real confidence the hope and the joy of the Easter story. Because at the heart of Easter, we find a king glorious, risen, and death-conquering king, a king who brings us to peace with the God we've turned our backs on and rejected, a king who gives us real and life-giving hope now and forever, a king who we fully believe is worth telling everyone about. So as we close this morning, let me ask you to consider Would you make him your king if he isn't already? This may be your first time with us. That might feel like far too much. That's okay. There's going to be no pressure. No one's going to check. You're not going to be asked to do an exam like in Steve's church on your way out. No, but if you do start to think that those lights are going on, if you do find yourself like John, like Mary in this story, believing that the empty tomb was real and that Jesus really rose from the dead, Let me ask you to consider making Jesus your king this morning. I want to just read the words of a prayer that I'm going to pray in a minute's time. And as I read it, just think about whether you can make these words your own if you'd like to follow Jesus as your king. In a minute, I'm going to pray, Lord God, I confess that I've spent my life at war with you, ignoring your rules and going my own way. It was for my sake that Jesus died on the cross. I'm sorry and I ask you for forgiveness through the power of Jesus' resurrection. I turn to Jesus in faith and pray that you would help me to follow him now and forever. As I say, if you're starting to think that Jesus really rose and really ought to be your king, then I invite you to pray that prayer with me. But I'll invite us all to just bow our heads and close our eyes. I'll uh, lead us in praying that prayer. Lord God, I confess that I've spent my life at war with you, ignoring your rules and going my own way. It was for my sake that Jesus died on the cross. I'm sorry, and I ask for your forgiveness through the power of Jesus' resurrection. I turn to him in faith and pray you would help me to follow him now and all the days of my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, if you did,